Today, we examine the potential legal fallout from Terra's stablecoin chaos. Plus, crypto prices bounce back after the Memorial Day weekend, and Fidelity's crypto business plans a hiring spree. Welcome to CNBC's Crypto World, I'm Mackenzie Segalos. Crypto prices on the move higher today. Bitcoin saw a big spike overnight, capping a rally that began over the Memorial Day weekend. Bitcoin prices up almost 5% in the last 24 hours to cross the $32,000 mark. Ether bouncing back too from a rough few weeks, back up to just under $2,000. And Cardano is grabbing headlines, gaining almost 18% since noon yesterday to make it the sixth largest crypto by market cap. Okay, on to the top stories. Morgan Stanley says venture capital deals in crypto could begin to slow down this year by as much as 50%. According to Coindesk, Morgan Stanley analysts said large tech and crypto investors appear to be prioritizing existing holdings rather than spending more cash on new projects. And that, quote, tourist capital seems to be exiting the scene. It's most reminiscent of the crypto bear market that stretched between 2018 and 2019, the bank said. Next, Fidelity's crypto division is about to go on a hiring spree. The Wall Street Journal reporting that Fidelity Digital Asset Services, which is a subsidiary of the investment giant, plans to hire 110 engineers and blockchain specialists. It also plans to add 100 customer service specialists. That comes after the investment firm said it would let people put Bitcoin in their 401k accounts later in 2022. The second incarnation of Terra's Luna token is off to a wild start on crypto markets. Terra launched the new coin this weekend after supporters voted to revive it and to leave Terra USD, or UST for short, by the wayside. Luna is, of course, the cryptocurrency that crashed in the last week alongside UST. The comeback of Terra 2.0 did not get off to a good start when it first hit exchanges over the weekend. But on Tuesday, Terra 2.0 listed on Binance, the world's largest crypto exchange. And as of noon Eastern today, prices were up more than 800% on that platform. The fallout from the collapse of UST and Luna Classic, the previous form of the Luna token, remains far from over. Just today, regulators in the United Kingdom proposed new safeguards to make sure that similar stable coins won't threaten the wider financial system. There's also the potential of civil or criminal action. A spokesperson from Terraform Labs declined to comment on the prospect of civil or criminal proceedings facing the platform or its founder, Do Kwan, but we spoke with George Washington Law School professor Randall Ellison on the legal fallout from the stablecoin chaos. Let's start with the most basic question here. Could Do Kwan face criminal charges in the U.S.? Sure, potentially. It all depends on the facts. I mean, the important thing to remember in a case like this is just because people lost boatloads of money doesn't necessarily mean there was criminal conduct going on. There's a lot of uh, a lot of investments fail, a lot of businesses fail, people lose a lot of money, and that and that's not always the result of criminal conduct. So, you know, if investigators looked into it and found actual fraud versus it's just it was a massive mistake or bad judgment or an error in the algorithm or whatever, right? If they find actual criminal fraud, then certainly uh, criminal charges are potentially possible, but uh, we don't know that yet, right? So how difficult is the burden of proof here for prosecutors? Well, it's pretty difficult. The criminal charges have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. I mean, that's the highest to a unanimous jury. I mean, that's the highest burden we have in the law. Uh, you know, for civil sanctions, fines and civil lawsuits by investors who lost money or civil sanctions by the SEC, the standard's far lower. They just need to prove, you know, misconduct or fraud by a preponderance of the evidence. Criminal fraud, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, is a high bar. And it's particularly difficult in these white collar cases because you're trying to prove what was going on in somebody's head, right? The, the, the entire case will hinge on what was going on in Kwan's mind um, because the facts are kind of undisputed, right? I mean, everybody knows that the the Terra, you know, failed spectacularly and everybody lost all the money. And those facts aren't really in dispute. The question is why and what was going on in his mind during the whole process. And because we can't read people's minds, that can often be difficult to prove. You're relying on circumstantial evidence and bits and pieces you can put together to lead a jury to infer that there was actual fraudulent intent going on versus just, like, like I said, something less. And so how do you do that? Are you looking at text messages, emails? How do you prove that intent? 
I mean, you look at emails, text messages, things like that. You hope to find kind of a smoking gun. You know, frequently prosecutors aren't fortunate enough to find that great email that lays out the whole fraud scheme. But you're looking for little nuggets of information and communications. You can have uh, testimony from witnesses who, you know, had conversations with him or who otherwise were involved. I mean, a classic way to build a fraud case like this is to do what we call working up the ladder, right? If there were multiple people involved, you build cases against lower level participants and persuade them to cooperate and testify. And if they had conversations with the upper level people, then that can be, you know, very important evidence. And then you also look for, again, little signs, inconsistencies, things that were done that are inconsistent with, you know, the truth or with a good, good faith, you know, efforts to market the investment, things like that that we call like badges of fraud, you know, little things that, that suggest that what, re what was really going on here was a deliberate attempt to deceive investors versus, uh, again, something less just a mistake or, or bad investments, things like that. I mean, an example would be in the Theranos case, you know, with the uh, 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 Elizabeth Holmes, you know, one example of that is, you know, using the other company's machines, right, to, to actually run the tests, but telling investors that their machines were working and performing these tests, you know, Things like that are pretty suggestive of an intent to actually deceive and defraud, steal people's money versus just, again, misjudgments or mistakes or, or other lesser forms of, of misconduct. Now, you spoke about this earlier, but outside of criminal charges, are there potential repercussions from the SEC, whether that's fines or penalties, or is this more the domain of the CFTC? A lot of other potential repercussions are probably actually more likely, right? Because, again, that criminal charge is so, so difficult to bring. But there can be civil sanctions from regulatory agencies like the SEC, the CFTC, and civil liability from lawsuits, right? I mean, investors who were burned uh, can certainly pursue civil claims and try to get uh, damages, get their money back. Uh, and again, that's probably, you know, much more likely than uh, potential criminal charges, uh, given that the standard of proof is lower. So, you know, frequently in these kinds of cases, the appropriate remedies end up being civil and regulatory and administrative and actually not criminal. I mean, how bad could the fines or penalties be from the SEC? Like, what's the worst case scenario here for Do Kwon? The fines can be based on the amount of the loss, right? So, I mean, they could potentially be pretty staggering when you're talking about what was a $60 billion loss or something like that in a, in a case like this. So, um, uh, potentially uh, extremely heavy. Um, the, uh, you know, there's going to be issues with jurisdiction and things like that too, you know, since he's not in the US, um, you know, South Korean authorities might have something to, to say about possible sanctions. And I, you know, uh, so there are a lot of other potential agencies or governments, you know, who could take a look at this conduct in addition to the private individuals who were, who were harmed. Okay, that's all for today, but we will be back again tomorrow and we'll see you then.